Hello everyone, it's Paul Tilly. Welcome back to HN 1100. Today I'm going to be talking about Chapter 12. And Chapter 12 really relates to issues that occur with changes in the workplace in a union environment. Now this is quite common. In fact, as I record this, General Motors has just announced that it would begin closure of the Oshawa assembly plant. And that's really a, a sign of how things are changing in our environment. If you think about industry over the last 20, 30 years, technological change, changes due to consumer preferences, changes due to technology, all of these things seriously impact the work environment. And as a result, uh, jobs may be lost, people may have different roles in their jobs. All of these sorts of things come to play. So we're interested in how this affects the union. So if you look at the uh, slides that I presented for chapter 11, uh, chapter 12, I'm sorry, uh, we're going to um, look at this concept, first of all, of successorship. Now successorship is a fancy term for what happens to a union when the company gets sold. So let's say, for example, you work for an oil refinery, and the oil refinery is owned by company A, and you're unionized, and you've got a collective agreement and all these wonderful things. And then company A sells the refinery to company B. Well, what happens to the union? What happens to the collective agreement? In fact, many Newfoundlanders can relate to this because company chance oil refinery, refinery has been sold several times over its lifetime. The simple answer is nothing. Nothing changes. With successorship legislation, essentially what it says is that if a company were to sell or trade hands, uh, the union contract stays in place, the employees stay in place, and the union stays in place. So there's no real significant point of difference from the employee's point of view. You know, the, the payee, payer on the check may be different, but effectively everything remains the same. So successorship really uh, applies very straightforward. It continues. Now, uh, there are other forms that we have to consider ourselves with, and when we think about the question of successorship, we can think about changes in the location of the business. Did the business move from city A to city B? Uh, sale or transfer, change or broadening of the purpose of the business, if the business changes its purpose, for example. And is work transferred from other locations, and what happens in those locations? So, essentially what we know is that when a change does happen, one of the parties affected can apply to the Labor Relations Board to declare successorship. In other words, what the union would probably do is be the initiator on this, is go to the Labor Relations Board and say, hey, you know, Labor Relations Board, and the Labor Relations Board is probably aware of it, that uh, our company has been sold, changed hands, um, your record should reflect that. If there's a declaration of successorship, the existing certification or collective agreement applies to the new business. The new employer will also be bound if there's a labor process underway. So, for example, if there's grievances with these things, the new employer continues and will continue just as per normal. If there's no specific test to be met by the board, uh, it will look for evidence of anti-union activity, but effectively the board will say, okay, we'll just change the name on the list uh, and uh, everything will go ahead. Now, if, if, for example, we sense that this new company coming in is, is out to disable the union, then the Labor Relations Board may step in. Uh, so uh, effectively, the, the major theme is continuity here. Everything continues. So continuity continues in the form of connection between the two forms of business and control effectively hand changes over. So uh, if the business moves from one place to another, again, the Labor Relations Board will look at it and say, you know, is this continuity continued? Does the business still exist? Are the employees still the same? Um, it, you know, has the business really functionally changed or has it remained the same but in a different location? Um, so control may be more important in situations involving new businesses or which are moving part of the business elsewhere. It's not necessary to prove control and continuity for successorship. So generally, successorship will, will ensure that the union stays in place. Other criteria that the Labor Relations Board considers when determining successorship could include things like direct contact. Do, is there a relationship there between the employer and the employees? Transfer of assets. 
identification of those assets, transfer of customer lists, transfer of accounts receivable, existing contracts or inventory, if there's some sort of a non-competition pledge, and, and most importantly, are the key people still in place? Is, is it pretty much the same? If a unionized business is expanding to non-unionized locations, or if a completely separate business entity owned by the employer is created, the board may issue a common employer declaration. Successorship gets a little bit gray when um, a company sets up a, a totally independent company somewhere else. So the question is, is this designed to eliminate the union? That's really the question that the board is going to ask. You know, did they do this for a legitimate purpose or was it designed to be able to take on unions? Uh, we've seen that happen, not so much in Canada, but in the United States where a lot of businesses have moved to non-union areas, say in the southern United States, in order to avoid unions. So here in Canada, or here in Newfoundland in particular, if a unionized business is expanding to a non-unionized location, or if a completely separate business entity owned by the employer is created, the board may issue a common employer declaration along with the declaration of successorship. So the board could find that, hey, this is, you know, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. So they're going to say, you know, it's, it's really the same business successorship applies. The next issue we discuss here is the issue of decertification. Decertification is when a union is taken away as the representative for the workers, and it normally happens under two scenarios. The first scenario is that uh, the workers are dissatisfied and they want to go with another union or leave this one. In this case, uh, there will be a vote, no different than a certification vote, and if the vote works against the union, the union is decertified. The second scenario occurs when the union is found not to be doing its work. If, for example, the union does not do the negotiations, does not represent its employees, does not, does not, does not, then the workers can go to the Labor Relations Board and say, sorry, uh, these guys are just not cutting it for us. We want you to decertify them. And the Labor Relations Board would decertify the union if they are shown to be just sitting on their hands. Another challenge that comes during the term of the collective agreement is when a union merges with another union. Here we'd have two unions, two separate unions. They become one. The question is then, what happens to the existing collective agreement? Well, essentially, the collective agreement stays in place. Technological change is yet another problem that occurs during the collective agreement, and a lot of agreements have in place certain provisions for technological change. Essentially, what happens is, during the term of the collective agreement, new technology is coming in place that's going to end up displacing workers. As a result of that, the union says, well, you know, what are we going to do in order to save our workers? We need a process to ensure that our more senior workers stay. We need a process to ensure a maximum number of workers stay, retraining, these sorts of things. So a lot of uh, collective agreements have this in place. And, and technological change is a form of workplace restructuring. That's pretty common with unions, too. And we should be aware that workplace restructuring often impacts union contracts as they exist if the, the situation occurs that the workplace fundamentally changes during the term of the collective agreement. Some agreements have opener clauses in them to allow for changes in the collective agreement, and some do not. If they don't, the changes need to occur when the collective agreement runs out. If there's an opener clause, there could be an agreement to reopen the negotiations and change a certain part of the collective agreement to reflect any of the changes that are, are occurring. So those are the key things in that chapter you want to look at, and uh, I invite any questions of yours. Thanks.